Uh, well, thank you. This is a, a tough passage. Um, it's got a lot in it that tells us how to live, uh, and it isn't necessarily all welcome. You know, in preaching through this whole series in Matthew's Gospel, um, we've always tried to start with the greatness of God and the goodness of God, and everything begins with who God is. Um, and it never really begins with who we are and what we do. Um, and in some ways, that's a very comforting kind of a message to bring because it means oh, everything's going to be okay. Whatever we do, it's fine. It doesn't kind of matter. God will look after us. Um, and it would be nice just to leave it there. But of course, we're not at liberty to do that. We have to preach what's actually in the Bible. And in these four short stories Jesus brings us in the passage that Phil has read, uh, we're reminded of responsibilities that we have. Yeah, and in preaching, you know, we can't just skip over these difficult parts and get on to the next easy part. Uh, it makes me think of Paul's words in Romans 11 when he says, consider the kindness and sternness of God. And we very much want to major on the kindness of God in what we bring in this church. But, you know, we're not given license in doing that to just ignore the sternness of God the demands that he makes of us. So we need to remind ourselves sometimes that God isn't a pushover. He's not a sky fairy. He's not a sugar daddy. He's not just there to give us the things that we want. You know, it's absolutely true that God is our Father who loves us. But it's also true that he's our awesome creator and king. And uh, the same gentle Jesus, meek and mild, who forgave the woman caught in adultery, and who's so kind to people all the way through the Gospels. That's the same Jesus who turned over the tables in the temple and threw out the money changers. You know, we now, those of us who are Christians, we've accepted the greatness and the goodness of God and accepted his forgiveness. In fact, you could say that's a definition of what a Christian is. Uh, those of us who have accepted God's forgiveness, recognizing his greatness and goodness. So that's fantastic position to be in. What we want to do today is look at what follows from that. What comes next then? How should we live? And that's why this series we're in at the moment is called Living the Jesus Way. Uh, Paul, again, writing to the Ephesians, says this, uh, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Now, if we've been called by God and forgiven by God, how should we live in response? And that's what these four stories are about that Jesus tells in this passage. So we're going to look briefly at each of them. I hope it's brief. Um, and then we'll have a bit of time to take your questions. Remember, you can email connect at fcchurch.co.uk uh, and Darren will bring me the questions at the end. So this first story, the one about the narrow gate that Jesus tells us not to take the broad path that leads to destruction, but to seek out and to choose the narrow gate that leads to life. You know, one of the things that really bugs me when I watch films is characters who'll do something dumb, and then when people call them on it, they say, I had no choice. Do you know what? You always have a choice. Life really is a succession of choices. What is life but choosing one thing after another? And this is what we're being called to do here, to consciously choose. You know, when you think about the world that we live in, it, the Bible talks about it being in darkness, about the world being unable to see God naturally because God is supernatural, because he's invisible, because he's perceived by faith. At the beginning of John's Gospel, he writes, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend it. So what that means is when Jesus came into the world, he was the light shining into a dark world, but the world didn't understand him. And that's the world that we all live in. Uh, except maybe a tiny, tiny number of people who live in monasteries or somewhere like that. We all live in a world that's full of non-Christians uh, and full of people just not seeing who God is. Now, um, that might sound frightening, and you might think, can we get God to take us out of that? The answer is no. Um, Jesus, praying for his disciples in John 17, says, uh, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. Now, it's pretty clear that God wants Jesus' disciples to be in the world. He wants us in the world. But we need to keep safe when we're in the world. So it's not a bad thing that we're in this world where we constantly have to choose. 
and where we're always in this stream where we're being pulled towards the easy, broad path. Uh, but it is a bad thing if we don't make the choice that God is calling us to. Now, you might be thinking, why would God put us in danger? Why would he leave us in a world that's full of these dangers? Well, you know, we're lots of different things. The Bible talks about the church as being um, the bride of Christ. It talks about us being a family. It talks us about us making up the body of Christ. Well, one of the many things it says about the church is that we are an army. Now, being in the army is not safe. It's not meant to be safe. Right? If it was safe, it wouldn't be an army. Uh, and we who know Jesus are sent into the world that does not know him, even though it's not safe, because we're on a mission. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, one of the environments I move in, we're all, we all live in slightly different worlds, right? We're all in different environments. We, we meet different kinds of people. I spend a lot of time talking to academics, and academics tend on the whole to be very skeptical. Now, that's not a bad thing. It works out well. It means, for example, that early in uh, the coronavirus development, when a lot of people were telling themselves comforting lies about how it was all just going to be over by Christmas and the rest of it, a lot of the people I, I deal with knew that wasn't right, and that they had a skepticism to look at what was being said and say, no, that that isn't right. So that's helpful, but that same helpful attitude can easily tip over into cynicism. So in the world that I move in, there's a lot of cynicism, and that translates into people assuming up front that there can't be a God, or if there is, he can't be good. Do you see what I mean? This is just that it's like, uh, I talk about the world that I live in, you could also say it's like a river that I swim in, and its current will take me down this way. But I need to choose instead to go that way. Even though that's the world I live in, even though it's the world I think that God has called me to be in, I still can't just go with the mainstream. I need to choose the narrow path. And each one of you live in the world that you live in. You're in the environment that you're in. You're in the current that you're in. And for each of you, you're going to face similar choices. They won't be the same as each other's choices or as mine, but you all face them. And the choice we need to make, always being aware of this, is that there is a narrow path that leads to life and that we must keep making that choice. Now let's move on to the second one, the tree and its fruit. Now, Jesus warns us to beware of false prophets. And that's maybe a, a surprising thing to crop up in the middle of this. Um, who are false prophets? Well, in the time that he was writing, he would have been referring to uh, people going around from synagogue to synagogue, or after that from church to church, bringing false teaching. And Paul has to deal with a lot of that in the letters. As you read the letters that he wrote to the early churches, a lot of what's in there is... Um, warning people and correcting people about false teaching that came. Now, we don't really have that now. What we do have is people turning up on the internet or turning up on television stations, sometimes with big visible ministries, looking very credible, looking very professional, looking a lot more professional than we do on a Sunday morning, but bringing a message that is not the gospel. And Jesus is warning us here, you've got to watch out. Do you know, uh, in uh, Matthew 10... Same, same gospel as the one we're looking at here. Jesus is going to tell his disciples, I'm sending you out as a sheep among wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and as harmless as doves. We've got to be shrewd. We've got to be you know, a little bit clever. We've got to have our wits about us. So we've got to be cautious who we listen to and who we believe. Now, if you come across someone preaching on the internet, bringing a message in the name of Christ, they're claiming it's a Christian message, but if to you it doesn't sound like the gospel, then you really can just stop and think and say, is this right? And one of the things that Jesus tells us here is that wolves will come disguised as sheep. So people are going to look like they're bringing a Christian message. That's what it means to be disguised as a sheep. But maybe they're not. So how can we tell? Well, Jesus says you judge a tree by its fruit by what people do, not just by what they say. So somebody might preach a very compelling message, but you've got to look at their lives. So the kinds of questions you want to ask about people would be, do they maybe preach about the importance of sexual morality, but they have affairs, or they're on their third wife? 
or does someone try and talk about science, but when you look into it, their credentials are, are falsified, they're not from a real university? Or in some cases, some preachers who are very prominent uh, preachers you can find on the internet and on television have been convicted of criminal offences like tax evasion. Now, if we could take seriously what Jesus says here, it's uncomfortable to talk about this, isn't it? You know, we don't really like to talk, we like to think everyone who brings a message in the name of Christ is, is bringing a good message. But he warns us that's not so. We've just got to be a little bit careful. Now, you should also, at this stage, you should be asking yourself, then, Mike, why should we listen to you? And it's, it's a totally legitimate question. You know, you've, uh, and it, it's kind of scary for me to say this, but the answer is you need to look at what I do. And if, if the way that I live doesn't match up to how you think a Christian should live, then you should not be too quick to believe the things I say. Now, I'm not perfect, obviously, but I hope that people who know me would say that I'm trying to live the right way, that my heart is turned towards Jesus, that the shape, the direction of my life is as it should be. So that's the question to ask. And it's the question I ask about people I listen to. Now think about who else preaches in this church. Tim preaches a lot. Now I'm really happy to listen to him because I know him a bit. I know what his life is like. I know what kind of person he is. I know that he's not a wolf dressed as a sheep. We have a Darren preaching from time to time. I know what she's like, you know? These are people I trust. And really, if you're going to be trusting a message that someone brings, you want to trust the person who's bringing it. Now, all of this, we sound like we're very wise. We're making careful judgments about preachers. How clever of us. Now, what does Jesus tell us about judging other people? He says, if you're going to judge other people, you've got to start by judging yourself. Before you criticize the speck in someone else's eye, you've got to take the plank out of your own. And that is what this third section is about, uh, the one under the heading True Disciples. Uh, let me just read to you again one short section of it. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. And that sounds amazing, doesn't it? That sounds like a description of a, a very impressive Christian. And yet, in this story, Jesus says to those people, I never knew you. Why is that? How can someone be that impressive but not be the way Jesus wants them to be? Well, the answer is, he's not looking for us to be impressive. He's looking for us to be obedient. He's not looking at our achievements. He's looking at our character. Um, you can see this uh, in Luke's gospel when he tells the same story. Uh, he begins by saying, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, uh, when you don't do what I say? Yeah, and again, this makes me think of uh, what we were talking about, people who bring a message on the internet or on television, claiming it's a Christian message, invoking the name of Jesus, calling him Lord, Lord, but actually they don't do what he says. Uh, and so we need to make sure we don't become that kind of person, that we don't become more concerned about how impressive we are than about how obedient we are, that we don't become more taken up by what we achieve than by who we are. And in John's Gospel, Jesus says this really, really simply, if you love me, obey my commandments. That's in John 14 and verse 15. If you love me, obey my commandments. Now, then, Jesus in this passage says that what he wants is those who actually do the will of the Father. And you may ask, how do we know what the will of the Father is? A lot of Christians get hung up on this. They worry, what's the will of God? What should I do with my life? Where, where should I go next? It can become, I think, sometimes quite paralyzing. What amazing gesture should I make to demonstrate uh, my commitment to God. This is an ancient question. Uh, people were asking it at least 700 years before the time of Jesus. And uh, God himself gave the answer through the words of the prophet Micah. And this is in chapter 6 of his book. In verse 7, uh, people are asking, oh, how can we please God? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? 
Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? And then in verse 8, No, people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It's not about grand gestures. It's not about huge sacrifices. It's particularly not about sacrificing your children, let me be clear. Uh, It's about the day-to-day life. You know, do what's right. Love mercy. Walk humbly. And this is about consciously making the right choices day after day, moment by moment. And that takes us back to the narrow gate, doesn't it? It isn't just one choice you make at the beginning of your life. You know, you don't come to a fork in your life, there's a narrow gate here, here's the broad road there, and you just pick one. That's not how it goes. You know, it's day by day. Every day, maybe every hour, you're going to come across a moment where you have a choice, narrow gate or broad path. And as we do what is right, love mercy, walk humbly, yeah, that's what takes us through that narrow gate over and over. Now, the the fourth and last of these passages is the one about the wise and foolish builders. Now, Fiona and I love the sunshine, um, and you don't get as much of it as you would like, of course, in this country. So we've thought it would be lovely to have a conservatory, but uh, building a conservatory is, is hugely expensive. There's no way we can afford it. We couldn't cope with the disruption of building and everything else uh, until we realized what is a conservatory It's just a greenhouse with a sofa in it. So we realized that we could put up a greenhouse and put a sofa in it, and that would be a conservatory. So we looked up on Facebook Marketplace, and we found a second-hand greenhouse for £2 and a second-hand sofa for £30. Um, And then we thought, okay, we're going to have a conservatory for £32. But, of course, we ended up having to spend a bit more money to lay a foundation to build it on and to replace broken panes of glass and the rest. And Jono and I uh, dug out the area where it was going to be, and we made a a frame out of four by twos uh, to be the foundation, and we're going to put paving slabs on it. Um, But then rather than go to all the trouble of mixing up concrete and hiring a concrete mixer, I just put laying sand in the frame. And then I realized I had literally built my house upon the sand two weeks before bringing this sermon on the importance of building on solid rock. So it wasn't my greatest moment. But here's the thing, you know, If the the rains come and the floods wash away the foundation and my conservatory, uh, well, we call it la conservatoire, actually, just to give it that touch of class. If the foundation sinks a bit, that's all right. It's only a greenhouse. You know, we can pick it up, move it to the side, put in a new foundation, put the greenhouse back. Here's the bad news. You can't do that with your life. The foundation you lay is there and you're going to be building on it for a long, long time. Now, Again, we're back at the question of choices. What choice are you going to make? Now, here's where people can misread this story. Sometimes you can read it as as just being a warning about how it's foolish to take shortcuts. So sometimes people will read this story and say, oh yeah, you've got to build your house on the rock. That means you've got to take the time and prepare things and do them right, and it'll pay off in the long term. That isn't at all what Jesus says, is it? His He's talking about a specific thing that's the foundation for our lives. He's not just talking about doing good jobs on things. What's the foundation? Is it Jesus' teaching? No. Is it hearing Jesus' teaching? It's not that either. It's following Jesus' teaching. If you go back and read that passage for yourself, you'll notice that the foolish builder is someone who hears Jesus' words but doesn't follow them. The difference between the foolish builder and the wise builder isn't whether they hear Jesus' words, it's whether they follow them. So yet again, we're talking about making choices. And what follows from choices? Consequences. Now notice that in this story, we're not reading that God punishes the person who builds their house on sand. We're not reading about a punishment. In fact, the thing that happens to the two builders is exactly the same. For both of them, the same things happen. The floods come, the rains fall, the rivers rise. The difference is the consequence of the choice that they've made. So the choices that we make 
to obey Jesus' words or not to are going to have consequences that determine whether our house stands or falls. And that is going to echo right through our lives and on through eternity. It's a stern warning. You know, these four passages taken together, they're warnings to us. So I'm going to quickly summarize. You remember we begin all this, first of all, this is so important, from the position we have as loved and forgiven children of God. Those who have accepted God's forgiveness and know his kindness. And then what follows from that? Well, from the first story with the broad and narrow gate, we learn that we face choices all the time. And we need to have our eyes open and be aware of that and respond by making good decisions. Secondly, we learn that we've got to beware false prophets. And particularly, that is, it means uh, wrong teaching. Things that come along saying they're Christianity, but they're not. All right? And the way to do that is to consider the actions of the people bringing the message. How do they live? The third thing is that we need to do God's will rather than just invoking his name. It's not enough for us just to say, Lord, Lord, and even be kind of visibly Christian in a way where you sit in front of a, a camera and talk on for ages about Bible passages. That's not enough. God's not impressed by that. What impresses God? The way that we live our lives. And the fourth thing from that story of the house built on the rock and on sand is that we must hear and follow the teaching of Jesus if our lives are going to work out the way that they ought to, if the consequences are going to be good for us. Do you know what? Nobody is going to go through life without storms coming and without floods rising. Everybody is going to run into things. There will be times in your life, if you've not had them already, when your circumstances are awful, when they're appalling. And the question then is going to be, what's your foundation? Is it a sandy foundation that's just going to get blown away and washed away? Or have you built on the solid foundation of not only hearing the words of Jesus, but living them? And by doing that is how we become the people that God wants us to be. Well, thank you for listening. I hope we have some questions. Okay, I've got a thumbs up from a Darren who's now going to sprint up from the back of the church with the questions. Actually, sprint is overstating it. Yeah, it's more a kind of a, an amble. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much, Mike, for bringing us that message this morning. As you can see, this is a really, really smooth transition. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have got some great questions. So I'm just going to open them up here. And then we'll... Oh, look, some more have come in just from when I was checking. Oh. So, Mike, I didn't put... Just quickly, I didn't put the image up of your beautiful conservatory because I was too busy conservatoire. reading... Conservatoire. Conservatoire. Yeah. I was too busy reading... The, the questions, which have been great, but so we'll pop that up in a bit so people can see it. It really is. If you're going to have a conservatory, guys, this is the way to go. Okay. Loving your um, comparison of the building on sand. Yeah. And yeah. I was... only realized as I was preparing this thing. <laughs> it, it did make me worry that my husband actually gave you advice on how to do it, and it was on the sand. <laughs> <laughs> Scott is innocent. Yeah. We'll have, a, we'll have a conversation with him. Right. Excellent. We've got our first question is coming in from Rosie, which is brilliant. So, Mike, you said that you feel that you are in the area that God has called you into, so mm. academia. So what would you say to someone who isn't sure if they are in the area that God has called them to? Right. Okay. Um, I think the best answer to this is um, I once heard somebody say... Um, I'm not sure if I'm married to the right person. And the answer was, well, now you are, because the person you're married to is the person you're married to. So, you know, whether or not you, you made the best possible choice when you chose who to marry, that's your marriage, and, and that's what you stick with, and, and you make it work. So, in the same sort of way, I feel like whatever area of life you're in, doesn't mean you're stuck with it forever, but it does mean this is where you are now. So this is where you've got to live. And it's no good um, being a, an academic and wishing that you're a professional dancer and thinking, well, when I'm in the professional dance world, everything will be better. 
And it's no good being a professional dancer and thinking, if only I were a landscape gardener. And moving in, in circles with other landscape gardeners and the special idiosyncratic uh, ways of thinking about things that landscape gardeners have. Where you are now, that's where you are. Uh, and that's where God is calling you to live the life of integrity that he has for you. Mm. So it doesn't mean you can't change down the line, but it does mean you don't need to be constantly wishing you were somewhere else. Mm. Mm, I like that. That's good. It takes away that kind of uncertainty. And also I feel that, that you know, when God wants us to move on, then he makes it quite clear because I, I get this sense the Holy Spirit really works. You know, he makes us uncomfortable enough where we are as well. And that can be yeah. true for those who are feeling that they're completely, you know, at home where they are, but the Holy Spirit does come along sometimes and say, actually, we need you to grow, we need you to develop, we, you know, and yeah. push you on. What, what do you think? Uh, I kind of want to get onto other questions, but there is an important yeah. thing to say here, so I'm sorry to take up a lot of time on this. When Fiona and I lived in uh, London, the church we were involved with, it was a church plant, and it, it didn't work, so it closed down. Um, and at that point, we didn't quite know what to do with our lives. So... Um, we could have moved basically anywhere in the world because uh, I was working from home and Fiona was going to just picking up again and starting a career as the boys were uh, coming out of their very youngest stage. So we could have moved anywhere. So we spent quite a lot of time praying for guidance and asking God, where do you want us to be? And, and we didn't really feel we got any kind of answer at all. So at that point, we just had to say to ourselves, if God wants us to live in, um, think of a funny place, I don't know, El Salvador, then, then it's on him to tell us that. You know, we're listening. We're ready to hear. But if he hasn't spoken, then we just make a sensible choice. You know, we're, we try to live as, as wise Christians and make choices that make sense. Uh, and that's how we landed up here in the Forest of Dean. Really, it was, uh, honest, honestly, people, why do we live here? It's not because we saw how great the people of the forest were and wanted to come here. It's because we found a, a house that was really good value. That was it. That's totally fine. Yeah. But and obviously, for us, it's worked out great. And I hope it's working out well for you guys as well to have us here. You know, so I would say that Fiona and I are in the will of God where we are. Mm. But we didn't get here by following like a clear signal, a clear sign. Mm. And sometimes there won't be one. Mm. Sometimes there is, of course. If you really feel that you know what God is saying to you, then absolutely obey that. But if you don't, that's nothing to panic about. Mm. Mm, very long question, Rosie. Thanks. Uh, very long answer. Thanks for the question. That's fantastic. Okay, so we have a, another question here now from Fiona, actually, which is great. So Jesus said that we have to be as shrewd as snakes in recognizing false teachers. But doesn't this seem judgmental? Doesn't Jesus also teach us not to judge? Right. So I think what's happening here is we're, we're tricked in the English language by two words that look the same, but they're not really. And I wonder whether it, maybe it's different in French and German. Okay. And it's this. Uh, it's the word judge can mean two different things. Adarian, I could make a judgment about you. So I look at how you live, and I think, how much do I trust this person? And that's shrewd. You know, that's wise. Mm -hmm. That's a sensible thing for me to do. But what I could also do is pass judgment on you. Mm -hmm. Now, that, it's the same word, judge, but it's a very different meaning, isn't it? Mm. So if I pass judgments on you, I'm condemning you or I'm writing you off. Um, I mean, not that I have any reason to do that anyway. Let's just make this clear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But that's a very different thing. So my understanding is when Jesus says, don't judge, he isn't saying, don't have an informed opinion. He isn't saying, don't think things through. He's not saying, don't make a judgment about things. He's saying, don't pass judgment on people. So, and that is really important. But it, you see, it's a different thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm, absolutely. Okay. So, I, um, Jonathan asked a similar question, you know, because of that judgment. But you know, should we not judge others mm. if we have a plank in our own eyes? To, yeah. Yeah, that's the same thing. So, right. We've got some really fantastic questions coming in from Richard Angel here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you ready, Mike? Yeah. So... I make hundreds of choices every day. Mm. Most are minor and not important. So how do I recognize the important choices where I must choose between broad and narrow way? Oh, such a good practical question. Mm. Um, I feel that 
on the whole, there isn't some kind of clear distinction between small choice, small choice, small choice, big choice that's got to be right. So to me, uh, all the small choices add up to who we are. So when the big choice comes, um, it's not a fundamentally different kind of thing. It's just more of the same. So every time we make a little choice that takes us down the narrow path, that, that makes us live more like Jesus, we're setting up who we are so that as the big choices come, we, we're going to make those choices right as well. Mm. So I would say, I'm not sure you necessarily need to stress about whether any given choice is a big one or a little one. Just make the right choice anyway, mm. you know, whether it's big or little, because it all builds up. You know, we're always building who we're going to be. Mm. That's fantastic, because actually, you just answered Richard's next question, which was, can a series of small choices build up? Um, oh, now, Rich has been really sneaky there because it looks like he's asked two questions, but really he's asked a question and then answered it. Mm, excellent. There you go. So um, now I really, really like this question. Is the credibility of mm. the messenger as important as the message? So Who's that from? That's from Richard again. Oh, Richard. Nice work. <laughs> okay. Um, so in, in the academic world, we have this uh, really important distinction. You know, what we don't do is make an ad hominem judgment, which means, it literally means to the man, but in practice it means that you dismiss an idea because of who brings it. Mm. So um, in academic terms, where you're only interested in is an idea correct or is the idea wrong, then you evaluate the idea on its own merits. Uh, that's the idea, at least. It doesn't always work that way. You know, in practice, um, some people seem to get better treatment than others, but let's, we don't need to go into that. But I think this is different. So in the Christian world, we're not just interested in an idea, but it, it, there's a whole package. Who is bringing it? How are they bringing it? What's the spirit that they're bringing it in? Mm. Um, you know, you could take a single doctrine, and depending on how it's brought, it can be really helpful or harmful. So we're very, very strong on grace, uh, and rightly. You know, it runs like uh, the letters through a stick of rock. Grace runs through the New Testament. And that's the message that God loves us, irrespective of whether we deserve to be loved. Mm. Now, that's a true message, but someone else could bring what, in a sense, is the same message, but it can be really destructive, because they bring it in a way that says doesn't matter what you do. doesn't matter how you live. So you could say it's not then. It isn't really the same message. But it, it comes from the same place, but brought by someone with a different attitude, mm. with a different heart, with a different character, the consequence is very different. Mm. So, yeah, ultimately, you know, if we can think clearly enough to pick apart the, the message and the good and the bad parts of the message from the person who brings it, then great, absolutely, do make those judgments. But that, that's a lot of work to be doing every time anyone says anything. Mm -hmm. So in the reality is, um, ultimately, you, you know, every single time Tim brings a message, mm -hmm. I don't feel like I need to go back and look up every Bible verse he mentions and say, oh, has he really put it in the right context or is he misleading me by misrepresenting this? No, I know he's not doing that because he's Tim and I know him. Mm -hmm. I know the guy who's bringing the message. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the same when you preach. Mm. So that, that's the thing here. You know, uh, the message and the messenger, in practice, they're very tightly bound up together. Mm. Yes, oh, I really uh, agree with that, Mike. Fiona's commented here, but doesn't um, Paul doesn't mind if the gospel gets preached for any motive, yeah. so as long as it gets preached. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, I think what Paul, the important thing here is Paul is saying if it's the gospel that's getting preached. Yeah. Now, you could pick up a random internet Christian preacher and find that they're bringing, for example, uh, the message that if you give lots of money away, then God will give you much more money. Mm. Now, that's not the gospel. No. So Paul is not going to rejoice that that is getting preached. Mm. But if somebody for any reason is bringing the message that God loves us and forgives us, then that's the gospel. Yeah. So why does someone bring that message? We don't know, but it's still the gospel. Mm, no, that's brilliant. Okay, so I think this is going to be a fantastic question. We probably we've been asked an awful lot and we've been helping a lot of people as we engage online, but looking at what um, you do was easier when we all spent time together. Mm. So do you think this is harder now so that 
because much more of our engagement is online. Yeah, that's very true. I'd not thought of that. Mm. I, I don't have a good answer to it, unfortunately, apart from agreeing. Mm. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting thing as it, it, it can be much harder because that accountability is different, isn't it? Yeah. You know, when you're actually face to face with people and in groups. But I think where our small groups have managed to stay online and mm. you, you have to, I think, just work harder at those relationships um, yeah. and to keep that connection going. I think we've been amazingly blessed with our online community. Right. And, and I think it, it is down to the people you've got to choose to engage in it. Yeah. And it's, it, again, it's that choice that you're talking about. It's mm. the narrow or the broad path. And choosing to engage online can be quite hard. You know, it takes different senses and a different amount of effort. Yeah, it's true. Mm. And we have, I mean, as a church, I don't know whether you guys feel that out there, but we have really tried very hard to try and keep what sense of community we can. Mm. And, and, you know, even things like all the Facebook groups about the Creation Watch and Baking Club and so on, even that, the idea is mm. to try and keep a sense that we're not all individuals isolated out there. Mm. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There's only so much you can learn about someone's character from whether they use butter or margarine in a cake recipe. <laughs> now we're getting personal, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Use butter. <laughs> so um, does the importance of obedience mm. linked to what we say highlight the need for us to live in communities? That's joining on from the last one. So how on earth yeah. can we live this out practically? Yeah, yeah I mean, it is really important. The, the, it's often been noted the New Testament never considers what it's like to be a Christian living as the only Christian. It, it just isn't the scenario that it has in mind. It's always about communities. Mm -hmm. You know, most of Paul's letters are written to churches. Uh, so much of, of what the letters say is written in terms of we do this, mm -hmm. never I do. You know, God has spoken to us. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very tough to be in the you know, continuing situation of um, isolation because of the virus. We now know that the spread of the Delta variant means it's very unlikely we're going to be able to relax restrictions on June the 21st. And for what it's worth, I think that that is the right decision. But that doesn't mean we don't hate it. Mm. You know, and there's, there's so much that we're missing. It isn't just that I couldn't go and see Kong versus Godzilla in a cinema or that I, I can't go to the curry leaf safely. It, mm. It's the time and the, the quality time that we spend together mm. and that the building of the Christian community where we build each other up. Mm. So yeah, it's a real loss and we just don't know, you know, when this is over, what kind of church we're gonna have left. Mm. And I hope all you out there watching YouTube uh, are gonna take every opportunity to join in with the community and be built together with other Christians. Mm, absolutely, definitely. So I think we're just being conscious of times. We have got a few more questions. So if your question hasn't been read out today, then Mike will answer your question personally in an email, just to put that on you, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. We've got some great questions, guys. Thank you so much. But um, just to, um, I've got a question for you, Mike, as well. Oh. So, sorry. Abusing the moderator privilege. Oh, definitely. Just two more questions. This one, um, you spoke in Micah um, chapter 6, verse 8. Mm. You said that God wants us to do what is right, to love mercy and to walk humbly. Yeah. So, but what does that actually look like in practice? Yeah. Can pull that out a bit for us. Do you remember Jesus tells the parable of the sheep and the goats? Mm -hmm. So he's speaking about people who, when they come to the final judgment, God is going to say to them um, that you loved me when I was... Uh, cold and naked and alone and they don't understand and say how did we ever do that and the answer is when you loved the weakest and most vulnerable people here on earth where they are then you were loving me mm. it's so simple and so powerful, powerful. you know and and th again this is another idea that just runs right through the new testament james talks about how taking care of widows and orphans is the purest form of religion so it really, a huge part of this is, how do we behave towards the weakest people? Mm. So that partly means things like financial generosity. Mm. Uh, it also means uh, how we spend our time. It means when you run into somebody who can't do anything for you, who isn't going to help you advance your career, or isn't going to cook you a great meal, how are you with those people? Mm. Now, I know a lot of Christians who are much, much better at this than I am. 
but I know that that's where I need to get to. That's where I want to be heading. That's what I want my character to be. Somebody who loves people who are not lovable in themselves. And why is that so important? It's because that's how God loved me. <laughs> so anything about me that is good now, it got that way because God loved me when there was nothing in me. Mm. So, and that's what we need to reflect. If we are the sons and the daughters of God, then we need to reflect in our character what his character is and how he was to us. Yeah, that's powerful, Mike. Thank you. Mm. Okay, guys, we're going to wrap up there. Um, it's been really great to have this live Q&A session with Mike. And guys, thank you for sending your questions in because, again, this is us trying to engage, you know, through this online community, mm -hmm. helping to, for all of us to feel a sense of um, fellowship together and community. So really thank you for joining in and sharing and spending time with us.